All right, how's everybody doing today? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. It is Wednesday, June 23rd, 2021. And we are live. Hope everybody's doing well today. So I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian, for those that don't know. And I wanted to uh, come on and talk with you all for a few minutes to let you know about uh, a new online course that I teach that is starting up on Sunday, July 4th, the 4th of July, Sunday, July 4th, 2021, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have a new section of Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We have a new course starting up. Uh, this is an online course that I teach. I've been teaching it, teaching it since uh, 2017, actually. And uh, a lot of people have been asking you. You hear about it on my uh, on my radio show. I'm on six days a week, the African History Network show. And a lot of people have been asking and saying, hey, let me know when a new class is starting up because I want to take it. Well, we have one starting up Sunday, July 4th, 2021. It's going to be 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. So I'm going to do a brief overview of what we deal with in the course. This is a 10 week online course. We deal with thousands of years of history and we deal with what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place as well. OK, so uh, when we deal with the transatlantic slave trade, we can't start in 1619 uh, in, in Virginia. OK, with the 20 odd Africans on the uh, White Lion pirate ship. We can't start in uh, 1441 with the Portuguese going into Mauritania. We have to deal with thousands of years of history and ancient Africa, now Valley region of Africa, and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade uh, taking place, okay, to better understand this. Uh, and we have to also deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, and what the Moors take into Europe. They take the teachings from ancient Africa, uh, especially ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet, and they take this into Europe, and this is going to bring Europe out of the Dark Ages, all right? So uh, it's a 10-week online course that I teach, and we do the classes live, and all the sessions are recorded, so you can go back and watch it over and over again, all right? And I do a PowerPoint presentation, so we're gonna go through uh, and do an overview of it and show you uh, some of the content uh, in the online course. And we also have um, guest speakers uh, periodically throughout the class as well. Um, Dr. David M. Hotep, who wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. Uh, we have him speak to the class. And um, I have a Saturday class that's wrapping up. We have like three more sessions in the Saturday class. So he spoke to uh, my Saturday class, he wrote this book here, and this is one of the sources that I use in the course, uh, ancient, uh, um, the first Americans were Africans documented evidence, by Dr. David M. Hotel. So we deal with the African presence in the Americas dating back at least 56,000 years ago in, uh, South America and at least 51,700 years ago in the land we call the United States of America. But he just spoke to my class, um, uh, on June 12th, my my Saturday class is wrapping up. And he just spoke to the class June 12th. He talked about new archaeological evidence that shows an African presence in Central America in Mexico about 250,000 years ago. So we're going to have him uh, speak to the class again. All right. I, I want to go to. Um, let, me, let me pull up the PowerPoint presentation. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in also. So this is a 10 week online course. Uh, it's on sale, $80, regularly $130. As soon as you register, you can start watching bonus content. OK, we're going to post a link here. And uh, what I'm going to do is since we have a uh, course that's wrapping up, uh, we're going to roll you. Uh, in the new course that starts Sunday, July 4th, but also will enroll you in the classes wrapping up this on Saturdays, 12 noon. Uh, so you'll be able to join us for three more sessions of the Saturday class. 
all those sessions are archived also, and you'll be enrolled for the new class as well. Okay, so this is an overview of ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'af, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Uh, and this started out as a four and a half hour lecture I did uh, January 24th, 2014. This is how this online course started. It started out as a four and a half hour lecture, which is about seven years of research. Then it evolved into uh, this online course. All right, and I'm a radio talk show host in Detroit. Uh, I'm on uh, Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight Eastern Standard Time uh, on 9, 10 a.m. the Superstation WFDF and Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We broadcast here on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, and my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel, when I do the radio show live. So you can tune in six days a week. Uh, you can also download the iHeart Radio app. Download the iHeart Radio app, and you can listen uh, to the radio station live and listen to my show live through the iHeartRadio app, okay? All right, so uh, this is the flyer, and you also see it at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, for the online course also. And when you, when you go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, just click on Register here right on the home page, and it uh, has the information. Uh, you, it'll uh, register you for the course. So w whenever I, I, I speak, I know I may say some things that are outside the circumference of some people's awareness, and there's going to be some things probably here in this preview that I say that may be outside of the circumference of your own awareness it does not mean that it's not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about. So I learned this from one of my teachers, Dr. Ray Hagens. Uh, I usually put the, have people put their fingers together to form a circle. And I usually say something like this. The space inside this circle represents my realm of knowledge. Everything that I think I know about whatever I think I know was represented within the circumference of the circle. I must keep in mind that there's still things to know that exist outside the circumference of my own awareness. OK, so just because, you know, everything that you know about what you know does not mean, you know, everything there is to know about what you know. OK, there's still things that exist outside the circumference of your own awareness. OK, so we have to keep that in mind. All right. Um, OK, now. If we look at this here. Uh, let's continue. So a lot of people, uh, one of the people we deal with in online course, we talk about Imhotep and Imhotep ties into history as well. So a lot of people ask uh, how you pronounce your last name. It's Imhotep. Imhotep means he who comes in peace in the ancient Middle Nether language. OK, Imhotep was one of also a person, a living person who's one of the greatest people who ever lived in human history. Um, Metal Nero is the ancient language of the uh, ancient Kemet II or the uh, ancient Kemites or ancient Egyptians. And uh, Imhotep was a high priest. He was a physician, architect, mathematician, designer of the Step Pyramid as a cower for Nesubiti Zosier or Pharaoh Zosier, because Nesubiti would be the correct term for uh, the, the pharaohs. Um, and this was in the third dynasty. Uh, uh, Designer of the Step Pyramid at Saqqara in the third third dynasty for Nesubiti Zosier. He was also known as the world's first multi genius. Okay, um, you see him living around twenty seven eighty BC to three thousand BC, somewhere between there, depending upon which timeline of history that you use. The dates may be two or three hundred years off. Okay, something like that. But you, you uh, you'll see him living anywhere from 2780 BC to 3000 BC because we know at least because we know at least 130,000 years of our history has been stolen. Uh, I go with the oldest dates uh, I can find. Okay, now also I encourage people to check out this book here by uh, Dr. Malefic Keti Asante. All right. This is uh, the Egyptian philosophers, the Egyptian philosophers. Um, the Egyptian philosophers, ancient African voices from Imhotep to Akhenaten. And this deals with ancient African philosophers. Uh, uh, Patahotep, uh, Imhotep, uh, Kunanup. Uh, he goes through and, 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 and lists a number of um ancient African philosophers before Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, Kagimni, uh, Sanchi. Um, so he has a, a number of them. OK, it, this is uh, uh, in ancient times. So check this out from Dr. Malefic Keti Asante 
the Egyptian philosophers, ancient African voices from Imhotep to Akhenaten. All right, let's continue here. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in as well. We posted the link here. You can go ahead and register for the online course. As soon as you register, you start watching the bonus content. You can watch the class that I do currently on Saturdays that's wrapping up. We have like three weeks left. All that content is archived. You can start watching that and you'll be registered for class number one that starts uh, Sunday, July 4th, 2021, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the 10 week online course. So this is Imhotep. These are famous statues of Imhotep. OK, famous depictions of them. This is Imhotep and this is not Imhotep. In the 2001 movie, The Mummy Returns, the villain uh, villain's name was Imhotep or one of the villain's names was Imhotep. Consequently, many of our children think that one of our greatest ancestors was evil and not of African descent. So they have this uh, Eurasian, Arab Eurasian looking uh, uh, depiction of Imhotep played by actor Arnold Vosloo. Okay. He was a high in the movie. He's a high priest named Imhotep in the movie. So, um, you know, we have to be very cognizant and protective of the media that our children consume. Okay. Cause this is, this is one of the main ways that our children are attacked. They're attacked through the media and this is programming. All right. Okay. Um, so right now, if you watch my show, you, you hear me talking about the attacks on critical race theory, the attacks on the 1619 project. All this is taking place. Backlash from Juneteenth, attacks on Juneteenth from the right wing. All what we're going to see, all this is dealing with history. And this all ties into what's taking place right now. Almost 400 voter suppression bills in, in, uh, 48 state legislatures. Um, the We just saw the uh, Republicans in the Senate on uh, Tuesday, June 22nd, uh, blocking the procedure to have a debate on the uh, voting rights, uh, on, on the uh, For the People Act, the, vote, the new voting rights bill, for the For the People Act. We see all these things taking place. They all tie into history. They all tie into history, okay? And we saw a lot of that also with the commemoration, 100th commemoration of the Tulsa Race Massacre, uh, June 1st, 1921. Uh, uh, and then we, we saw it June 1st, 2021. All this ties into history as well. OK, so these are uh, many of the things that we deal with in the class and we deal with how history and politics and laws intersect, how they collide. This is why we deal with a chronology of history. We're going to deal with tens of thousands of years of history and bring all this up to the transatlantic slave trade and go through the transatlantic slave trade up to the uh, basically up to the Civil War. OK. All right. Now, I, I want to go through and just show you a few recent articles and we see how all this collides and this attack attack collides from Republicans from the right. And they're trying to shut down discussions of critical race theory shut down and one most of them can't tell you what critical race theory is but they're trying to shut down discussions when it comes to uh systemic racism teaching the history of slavery etc all right and if you watch my show uh six days a week you know we go through and break all this stuff down okay so if we look at this here uh now this article is from usa today uh, mock slave auctions, racist lessons, how U.S. history class often traumatizes and dehumanizes black students. OK, mock slave auctions, racist lessons, how U.S. history class often traumatizes, dehumanizes uh, black students. And w every February we see these slave lessons gone wrong. Uh, and even throughout the year, we hear about these lessons that are insensitive to African-Americans. Uh, slave reenactments and things like this in class, slave like board games, et cetera. OK, and and all this ties into history. These are things we also have to protect our children from. Now, one of the things that I use in the uh, one of the things I teach from, we use this in the class and you hear me talk about this on my show is. Uh, this study here from the Southern Poverty Law Center, teaching hard history, American slavery, teaching hard history, American slavery. And this is a 52 page study that breaks down how 
uh, the history of slavery is being incorrectly taught in schools all across the country and how to more correctly teach this history, how to more correctly teach this history. OK, so you can download that from the Southern Poverty Law Center, SPLCenter.org, uh, and it's called Teaching Hard History, American Slavery. Uh, we'll post the link here for you as well. And you can download it's free to download. Every school district in the country should be using this because if they did this and, and then also lays out numerous um, strategies and, and different ways to more correctly teach the history of slavery also. OK, if school districts use this, it would make a big difference. We'll talk about this more in just a minute here. Now, this is another article here. This is from uh, February 10th, 2021. Republican state lawmakers want to punish schools that teach the 1619 project. Republican state lawmakers want to publish uh, punish schools that teach the 1619 project. And what we've seen is that um, because of the executive order that Donald Trump did in September 2020, uh, banning uh, critical race theory and different types of diversity training, things like this. This is where the attack on critical race theory from Republicans really started going back to September 2020. Critical race theory is a is a um, 40 year old uh, theory. Uh, it's a 40 year old uh, ideology that is taught not in K through 12, but is taught in uh, graduate schools, basically graduate schools in college and law schools. It's a legal, a legal analysis. It's not taught in K through 12. So, but you hear this hysteria coming from Republicans and you have about 20 different, uh, states that have passed some type of, uh, law banning critical race theory. And all they're trying to do is galvanize, uh, galvanize support amongst their followers, galvanize support amongst Republicans because they're not, passing uh, or advocating from bills in the House of Representatives uh, or the U.S. Senate that are in general beneficial to everyday Americans. So they're fighting these culture wars, OK, fighting these culture wars, trying to galvanize support and win back the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate in the 2022 midterm elections. Now, we know we just commemorated. Um, we just celebrated uh, Juneteenth and uh, Juneteenth is a federal holiday now past the House of Representatives and it passed the Senate because there was no opposition to it in the Senate. So it just passed. They didn't take a a, a formal vote in the Senate, the yay or, yay or nay vote like they did in the House. OK, there were 14 Republicans, 14 white male Republicans who voted against Juneteenth becoming the federal holiday in uh, the House of Representatives. Uh, check out the African History Network on Facebook and uh, Michael Lim Hotep on YouTube. And you can see the broadcast I've done dealing with the real history of Juneteenth. But when we understand this history and the more we understand about this history, the more we understand ourselves, our history gives us our, our values, our interests and our principles. Uh, this gives us a cultural paradigm we see reality through, but this influences our economic empowerment and political empowerment. This teaches us about the, the politics and the laws and policies that need to be put in place so we understand the past. We, we, we can better prepare ourselves for the future. OK. Um, and what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard and seen about yourself. So all these laws and policies that we're advocating for, whether we talk about the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, whether we talk about um, uh, debt forgiveness for uh, student loans, uh, all this comes out of a historical context. And we most and most of these things we can trace back to a legacy of slavery as well. Whether we talk about reparations and uh, Juneteenth, Juneteenth is directly related to reparations, repairing the damage of slavery. Uh, all this is connected. But this article here from the New York Times. And we talked about this uh, on my show as well. This article here from the New York Times. This is from. Um, what date is this? This is from. Let me flip over and look at the article from the Times. I think this was uh, July uh, 16th. OK. Um, yeah, July 16th, 2021. Most Americans know little or nothing about Juneteenth poll fines. Most Americans know little or nothing about Juneteenth poll fines. Uh, it's about 60 percent of Americans know little or nothing about Juneteenth. Now, African-Americans have been celebrating uh, Juneteenth to various extents. 
uh, since 1866. If, if uh, 60% of Americans know little or nothing about Juneteenth, how much do they know about slavery? America must have a massive history lesson. America must have a massive history lesson. And many African-Americans don't know about slavery, don't really understand the history of slavery, et cetera, and reconstruction, what happened after slavery. Uh, so Americans in general are very ignorant of history. And we, we see this also when we look at um, January 19th, 2021, there was a story from CBS this morning, CBS this morning. Uh, and they did a story how uh, most Americans don't know what's in the U.S. Constitution. OK, then we look at uh, studies from uh, AL dot com, uh, Alabama dot com. Um, two thirds of Americans um, cannot name the three branches of government. OK, two thirds of Americans cannot name the three branches of government. So when we go through and look at this, people's understanding of history largely influences who they vote for, who they uh, the policies they support and who they vote for political office. When you, you when you have elected officials who are ignorant of history. OK, oftentimes they're voted voted in the office by people who are ignorant of history as well. OK, so when we try to get our issues and concerns met, all this is dealing with historical context. And people who are ignorant of history are not fit to serve in political office, state legislature, uh, U.S. House of Representatives, U.S. Senate, president. OK, it's too much damage that they can do. That's too much power for ignorant people to have. Uh, if you read this article here from AL.com, Alabama.com. One in five Americans can't name a single branch of the U.S. government. This is from September 19th, 2019. OK, one in five Americans can't name a single branch of the U.S. government. Now, Senator Tommy Tuberville from Alabama, when he was running for the Senate, he could not name three branches of, of, of government. OK. All right. Judicial, executive and legislative. He could not name the three branches of government. He's running for a U.S. Senate to be a U.S. senator. He won the U.S. Senate seat. He also could not explain the, the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And he's from Alabama. We know Selma, Alabama was ground zero for the uh, uh, fight for the 1965 Voting Rights Act. If we look at this article quickly here, one in five Americans can't name a single branch of the U.S. government. Now, all this ties into history and this deals with what we deal with in this 10 week online course. OK, and politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power and resources and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments and treaties, their adoption, interpretation and enforcement. This is all connected. Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power and resources and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments and treaties, their adoption, interpretation and enforcement. So a recent survey found uh, America may need to go back to civics class. Civics largely has been taken out of the schools. Unfortunately, this is why we have to teach this to our children and civics has to be put back into schools. Uh, Annenberg Public Policy Center's Civics Knowledge Survey found only two in five American adults or 39 percent could correctly name the three branches of government. Only 39 percent could correctly name the three branches of government. OK, so you're looking at about close to close to two thirds. We're looking at about 61 percent who could not name the three branches of government. Almost two thirds of Americans cannot name the three branches of government. That figure was the highest in five years, up from 32 percent the, uh, the previous year. OK, so in 2018, it looks like 2018, only 32 percent of Americans could name the three branches of government. It makes no sense. But then you see how a lot of these ignorant Republicans get elected in the office and some ignorant Democrats like Kristen Sinema of Arizona. OK, they. People don't understand history, don't understand the Constitution, things like this. One of five adults could not name any branch of the federal government. One of five adults could not name any branch of the federal government. The study showed. This is from AL.com. Now, how much do you think these people know about the history of slavery? How much do you think they know about the history of slavery? How much do you think they know about the Civil War? All this fight today, all these issues today 
are are the result of history. OK, so the more that we understand this history, the better we understand how to navigate through all this and understand these policies that need to be put in place and understand how to get these policies passed. I was speaking in um, Atlanta at the uh, at the ninth annual Juneteenth Festival, uh, uh, June 18th through the 20th, 2021. OK, and I was doing two presentations there. I was speaking Saturday and Sunday, and I was a, a vendor as well. And, uh, you know, I asked maybe about 50 people in total, maybe more than that. How many seats in the House of Representatives are there? No one could tell me. They had to think and look, the U.S. House of Representatives, nobody could tell me. There are 435 seats in the House of Representatives. I asked people, how many votes does it take to get a bill passed in the House of Representatives? All this ties into history. This is all connected to history rooted in the U.S. Constitution. These are things we deal with in this 10 week online course. Ask people, explain to me. Uh, how many votes does it take to get a bill passed in the U.S. House of Representatives? No one can tell me. It takes 218 votes. A simple majority, 218. How many how many seats in the U.S. Senate? Nobody could tell me how many seats in the Senate. There are 100. Based upon the U.S. Constitution, every state has two U.S. senators. How many votes does it take to get most bills passed in the Senate? Nobody could tell me. I'm asking adults. I'm not talking to talking about five year olds. I'm asking African-Americans adults. I'm in Atlanta. Atlanta, Georgia has the largest Confederate monument in the country. It's called Stone Mountain. On the side, it's a huge mountain on the side of Stone Mountain. You have you all seen Stone Mountain? I've climbed to the top of Stone Mountain. OK, they have a pathway where you can climb to the where you can climb to the top of Stone Mountain on Stone Mountain. You have the um, uh, reliefs of uh, the carvings of three Confederate uh, they call heroes. OK, you have General Robert E. Lee of Virginia. You have uh, Thomas Stonewall Jackson and Jefferson Davis. Who, who was the president of the Confederacy. Okay, this is this is Stone Mountain. This is the largest Confederate monument in the country. This is in Georgia right now. Stone Mountain, read this article here from uh, Smith, Smith, uh, SmithsonianMag.com, official website of the Smithsonian Institute. What will happen to Stone Mountain, America's largest Confederate memorial? Okay, this is there in Georgia right now. So all this deals with deals with history the fight to remove confederate monuments okay the fight to rename military bases that are named for uh confederate soldiers and confederate generals and these are traitors to the union who committed treason against the union based upon article 3 section 3 of the u.s constitution and they took up arms against the union they seceded from the union starting with south carolina december 20th 1860 six weeks after abraham lincoln became president-elect and he was president elect of the, the Republican Party, uh, November uh, 1860 presidential election. And we're going to see uh, the Civil War start the following year, April 12, 1861. When we deal with Juneteenth, Juneteenth is directly tied to all this history. And, and, and making Juneteenth a federal holiday, if you watch my videos, I've been breaking this down. To make Juneteenth a federal holiday, what this is doing, this is forcing a national conversation about a history that Republicans are passing laws to suppress the teaching of that history in schools. This is forcing a national conversation. America has to have a massive history lesson. Americans are very ignorant of history. This is why many Americans still think that it was the Emancipation Proclamation that freed enslaved Africans. And it was not. It was the 13th Amendment ratified December 6th, 1865, when Georgia ratified the 13th Amendment. OK, we're going to continue. How's everybody doing here? Everybody share this broadcast on your social media platforms. I'm Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture, writing historian. Uh, I'm doing an overview of a 10 week online course that I teach called Ancient Kemet. This is one of the original names for Egypt. Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. Now, the Ma'afa is a key Swahili term, which means uh, our, our great disaster, our Holocaust. OK, and this is a 10 week online course that I teach. We deal with thousands of years of history and we do what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. I'm going to post a link here. You can register for the online course right now. It starts up Sunday, July 4th, the 4th of July. 
Sunday, July 4th, 2021, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com and scroll down uh, the page, you'll see the information. You'll see information for uh, my radio show. I'm on six days a week. Uh, I'm a radio talk show host here in Detroit on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation WFDF. I'm on Terrestrial Real Radio, Terrestrial Radio. They have us broadcasting from home because of COVID-19. Um, and then you, you can click here to listen to audio podcasts of the shows as well. And the video podcast on Facebook and YouTube. You can click here to read articles that I've written also. Um, so this is a 10 week online course. It starts up Sunday, July 4th. And we have the fly here as well. Okay. Uh, click here to register here. It takes you to the next page and click right here to enroll. As soon as you enroll, you can start watching content. Okay. So what we're going to do is, um, we have a class that meets on Saturdays right now that's wrapping up and you're going to get enrolled in the Saturday class. So you can start watching the content going back to class one and you can join us in the Saturday class, which meets uh, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So you can join us for the last few sessions of the Saturday class and you'll be enrolled in the Sunday, July 4th class that starts with class number one. It starts with class number one for the 10 week online course. OK, so uh, as soon as you register, you can start watching content. And uh, we have an overview here of uh, the course as well. OK, and the class is regularly hundred thirty dollars on sale, eighty dollars. Uh, we do the class live. All the sessions are recorded. So if you missed the class or something like that, of course, you can go back and watch it. It's all archived. Not a problem. And you still have access to the course. You can still watch the content even after the course is over. So next year, you can still go back and watch this course that you registered for. I'm going to post a link here again. Uh, you can use this with your children. You can use this to educate your children as well. A lot of people are looking for content uh, that they can use with children. Uh, I would say this class is PG-13. So th th your children can watch along with you if you want. Or there may be information you want to take from here and use with your children. There are books that we use in the course. Now, you don't have to buy any of the books, uh, but there are books that we use. Like some some of you may want to get for your own personal library, but you don't have to feel obligated to buy any of these books to follow along in class. These are two books that I use. Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivy Van Sertema, uh, as well as Black Star, the African Presence in Early Europe by Renoko Rashidi. Renoko is a friend of mine, brilliant, brilliant uh, scholar, brilliant historian, uh, voracious, uh, prolific uh, writer. Uh, he's a world traveler. Uh, he's been to over 130 countries and islands. And he has an essay in this book here dealing with the Moors. So when we deal with the Moors, these are two books that I use on that uh, for that. This is another book that I used before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett Jr. This is a beat up copy, the sixth edition. Before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett Jr. is another book that that I use. Um, we use this book here, the Declaration of Independence and other great documents of American history, 1775 to 1865, edited by John Grafton. So we deal with the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. This one, uh, last time I checked, this is like two dollars. It's from uh, Dover Books. OK, very inexpensive. And uh, another book that I use is, let's see here. Another book that I use is, let me look here. Uh, Nile Valley Contributions of Civilization by Tony Browder. Um, we also use this one here. Now this book is out of print, but Dr. David M. Hotep comes and speaks to my class live. He's a friend of mine. A lot of these scholars are some of my teachers. So some of them we have speak to our class live. Uh, the First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence by Dr. David M. Hotel. It's another book that I use. His new book will be out in about two or three weeks. He just spoke to my class on June 12th. Uh, the Saturday class is wrapping up. And of course, we use uh, Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder. And I'm trying to see where that book is. Also, Egypt on the Potomac. Egypt on the Potomac is another book that I use as well. Uh, 
Okay, I'm not sure what those are. Oh, over here. I've got hundreds of articles all over the place. Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization as well by Tony Browder, as well as Egypt on the Potomac. So those are just a few of the books that we use as reference in the online course. Uh, let's continue here with the uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation. So read this article from the New York Times. And I dealt with this on my on my show um, Tuesday, uh, June 22nd, uh, the African History Network show. 60 uh, Most Americans know little or nothing about Juneteenth poll finds. This is forcing America. This is forcing a history lesson on America, a much needed history lesson. So. Yeah, this is teaching hard history of American slavery from the Southern Poverty Law Center. OK, this is the cover of the study that I, I was talking about. Um, this one right here. This study here, and you go to SPLCenter.org, you can download it, SPLCenter.org. And I've, uh, this is one of my teachers, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, who I actually talked to yesterday. I sent him a video of an interview that was done with me on the Urban Information News Network here in Detroit, dealing with the history of Juneteenth and Juneteenth become the federal holiday. And he called me, we talked. So I'm uh, setting up an interview with him. I've interviewed him a number of times in the past, I think about 17 times. But this is one of our great grandmaster scholar, uh, scholars, uh, Dr. Leonard Jeffries. And Dr. J says, whoever controls the images, controls your self-esteem, self-respect and self-development. Whoever controls the history controls the vision. OK, this is why. We this is why we have to fight for uh, against negative stereotypical images of African-Americans as well, because these images are also exported around the world. And this ties into history as well. OK, now when Dr. Leonard Jeffries and, and, and Professor James Small teach two of my teachers, and if you listen to my show, you've heard interviews I've done with them over the years. They talk about the pyramid principle. OK, now here's a um, the pyramid of Khafre at Giza. And the pyramid has uh, three sides. OK, the foundation is African history and culture It's African history and culture. It gives us our foundation. It gives us our values, our interests and our principles. And this influences our uh, political empowerment uh, as well. OK, uh, our values, our interests and our principles. This gives us a cultural paradigm that we see uh, reality through. And uh, this influences how we engage in economics. OK, do we use European capitalism to engage in economics or do we use um, um, African concepts of of uh, economic empowerment, which is, which are the co-ops, the cooperatives? OK, which are concepts that we brought with us from Africa. If you read Collective Courage by. Dr. Jessica Gordon Nimhart, Connect Collective Courage, which deals with a history of uh, cooperative economics and the co-ops that we had. Uh, the, where's that book, Collective Courage? Right here. Collective Courage by Dr. Jessica Gordon Nimhard. Um, This deals with the co-ops that we had, even during slavery. The uh, things like the Free African Society of uh, 1787, the Colored Merchants Association, uh, founded about 1928, which comes out of the uh, Negro Business League, the National Negro Business League, and the Colored Merchants Association was an association of um, African American grocery store owners. The uh, Colored Farmers Union, uh, founded in 1886 in Texas, which grows to have uh, about 1.2 million members, is probably the largest co op that we had. We have a deep, rich history of economic empowerment, but that's tied to the co-ops, the cooperatives, where the members are also owners, part owners. The probably the most well-known type of cooperative is a credit union. OK, a credit union that comes from the co-ops in this this concept of cooperatives are concepts we brought with us from Africa. OK, so we have a deep, rich history uh, of this, but a, a lot of people don't know this. We were doing things like raising money for people who were in slavery, buying them out of slavery, 
Uh, you have benevolent societies raising money for burial cost for African Americans. We have a whole deep, rich history of uh, cooperative economics. So cooperative economics is not black capitalism. It's not like capitalism dressed up in red, black, and green. Okay, the concept of the cooperatives are, is much different. Okay, so this is why we have to really understand that. But that comes from uh, understanding African history and culture. That gives us our, our foundation that influences how we engage in economics, how we engage in uh, political empowerment. This we, we have to have a synthesis of all three of these as well. It's not just one. We have to have a synthesis of all three of these. OK, now, uh, very briefly here, read this article from the Atlantic dot com. What are kids what kids are really learning about slavery? What kids are really learning about slavery? And this was the first article I saw that dealt with the uh, uh, study from the Southern Poverty Law Center. This article came out February 1st, 2018. What kids are really learning about slavery from the Atlantic dot com. And in the study teaching hard history, American slavery from the Southern Poverty Law Center. They did a survey of 1000 high school seniors about what they know about the history of slavery. Uh, only 8%, only 8% of high school seniors surveyed could identify slavery as the central cause of the Civil War, only 8%. Fewer than one third or only 32% correctly named the 13th Amendment as the formal end of US slavery. Only 32% knew this. Now, what this means is, is that most likely their parents didn't teach them and probably their parents don't know either. Americans are very ignorant of history. When we deal with issues and policies pertaining to us, they come from a historical context, a legacy of slavery, Jim Crow segregation, uh, housing segregation, different things like this. And we have to have people who understand history or at least are willing to learn history to be able to understand the importance of these policies and why they need to vote yes, as opposed to no on policies pertaining to us. But we also have to understand this as well, because many of our people don't understand history. Half, half our people still think Willie Lynch historically existed. Willie Lynch never historically existed. Number one, not only did Willie Lynch not exist, the Willie Lynch letter has been proven to be a fraud. The Willie Lynch letter 1712. There, there are words in the Willie Lynch letter that didn't even exist in the early 18th century. And the syntax, the sentence structure of uh, uh, of of uh, the English vernacular was different in uh, the early 18th century than it is in the 20th century or the 21st century, late 20th century, uh, 21st century. Dr. Kwabina Ashanti came out and admitted he wrote the Willie Lynch letter about 1970. It, it's a fraud. And Willie Lynch never historically existed. That's why you don't hear any abolitionists talking about Willie Lynch. Or you don't find Willie Lynch anywhere in history. Now, there was a Captain Willie Lynch in the 19th century, but that's 100 years later. It was, that's 100 years later. This is a different person. So let's continue here. So uh, read this one here from uh, theatlantic.com. OK, and this shows how little 12th graders actually know about history and about the history of slavery. Um, and fewer than half or only 46 percent of 12th graders surveyed identified the Middle Passage as the transport of enslaved Africans across the Atlantic Ocean to North America. So we have to educate our children on this. This is a study here, new study. Uh, this is an article from the root.com. New studies find that positive feelings about blackness improve academic, academic performance for black girls. This was an article in the Journal of Blacks in Higher Education, a study by Professor Sharita Butler Barnes at uh, Washington uh, University in St. Louis. So check that out. Uh, very quickly here. OK, this is the step pyramid at Saqqara that uh, Imhotep was the architect of in the, in the Supiti Zosier or Pharaoh uh, Zosier. This is an early form of pyramid building technology, the Mastaba, the flat bench pyramid. The ones of Khufu, Khafre and Menkere, we see a much more intricate. Uh, we see that pyramid building technology evolves over hundreds of years. So here, here are some more of the things that we deal with in the online course. OK, how's everybody doing today? How you all like this type of information? Share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in. Also, we deal with what was the transatlantic slave trade? OK, and once again, I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips, etc. We do a what was the transatlantic slave trade? Um, and I we we I 
deal with a timeline of history as well that deals with tens of thousands of years of history so we can frame uh, the conversation properly and we can understand chronology and cause and effect. So it's important to deal with uh, chronology of history. Uh, what was the transatlantic slave trade? What were some of the events that led up to the transatlantic slave trade starting? What role did Christopher Columbus play? Columbus is crucial. It's essential to, to understand Christopher Columbus and the role Columbus played in um, spreading the transatlantic slave trade. It didn't start with him, but his his four voyages starting August 3rd, 1492, when he set sail on the Nina de Penta and the Santa Maria helped to um, spread uh, slavery and the, the attack on indigenous people. Uh, it helps to uh, spread racism and capitalism, the exploitation of indigenous people. And we're going to see uh, the, the Spanish uh, uh, conquering areas, Haiti, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Honduras, Panama. They're also setting up these sugarcane plantations as well. They're, they're killing the indigenous people. They are bringing in Africans, shipping in Africans, enslaving them as well. And we're going to see the transatlantic slave trade really explode um, from this, and, as well as the Asiento de Negros of uh, about 1517 signed by King Charles V, also known, known as King Charles I. Okay, the Asiento is uh, extremely important to understanding the spread and the growth of the transatlantic slave trade. And the Asiento dealt with, um, it was a license given to uh, slave trading nations, uh, giving them license to uh, supply uh, African slaves to Spanish colonies, two Spanish colonies, the Asiento de Negros. Okay, this is something that we talk about in the course, and it's very important to understand uh, the Asiento, the Asientos. Uh, what role did Christopher Columbus play? And it, it, the other thing that's really important to understand about Columbus is when you look at where Columbus went on his four voyages, and we'll show you this in just a minute, Columbus never came to the land that we call the United States of America. Columbus never came to the land that we call the United States of America. The closest he came here was Cuba, which is 90 miles away. So all the statues of Christopher Columbus around the country, that, that largely comes from the Italian American influence and Italian, Italian Americans pushing for this. OK, all those statues really should come down. OK, he he he, he, he was a terrorist. He was um, he inflicted genocide amongst the people. And. Uh, he's not somebody that should be honored. We see uh, more and more uh, cities and states are uh, celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day. But, uh, uh, you know, Columbus was a master of genocide. This is not somebody that we should be celebrating, especially African-Americans, because a lot of people he was killing were African-Americans also. Were African people. All right, now. Um. We do it. When did Africans first come to the U.S. as slaves, as enslaved Africans? And I know there's a whole lot of focus on 1619. OK, a lot of focus on 1619. 1619 in Virginia did happen, but African people were in this land going back tens of thousands of years before 1619. OK, this is something that is is important to understand. Um even when you just look at the Spanish taking Africans into the area that we call um, South Carolina, they were doing that in 1526. This is 93 years before, 93 years before uh, Virginia. Okay. 93 years before Virginia. And when we look at um, uh, Juan Garrido, and we talk about this, um, when we look at Juan Garrido in 1513 coming into uh, Florida with the Spanish conquistador Juan Ponce de Leon, Juan Garrido was of African descent. He was born in uh, West Africa around 1480. So Juan Garrido, we know this may be the first African we know of by name. We know he was here in 1480. Okay, that's before 1526. And that's in Spanish territory, Florida. Okay. So this is long before 1619. 
So this is why we have to understand this chronology of history. And, and it's important to know that African people did not first come to this land conquered by Europeans shackled in chains either. Uh, we deal with, uh, did Africans sell themselves into slavery? We deal with that complicated history. Were African people in America before the slave trade? Yes, we were. Okay. Uh, yes, we, and, and, and when you read the first Americans were Africans documented evidence, and this is why this is one of the uh, sources I use in the class. Uh, we were in this land before Native Americans came into existence. We were in this land before Native Americans came into existence also. Okay. The first Americans were Africans documented evidence by Dr. David M. Hotel. Uh, we um, African people of Khoisan have the oldest DNA on the planet. They come from Southern Africa. They go all around the world. And um, they were in this land uh, as well. The short statured Africans and okay? the short statured Africans ancestors that I knew in the Trois. There, there's a uh, article from face to face Africa dot com that deals with the. Um, deals with the Khoisan and uh, let me pull this up here from face to face africa.com because see in the course what we do is show you how to connect all these things together these news articles that you see uh we show you how to connect all this together and then we also decode symbols as well there's a symbol encyclopedia that I use. So I encourage people to get a symbols encyclopedia. Uh, mine is right here. Signs and symbols. An illustrated guide to the origins and meanings. Signs and symbols. An illustrated guide to the origins and meanings. This has 2000 uh, symbols in it from uh, from around the world. OK. 2000 symbols. It decodes them. And symbols are related to culture and history. The first page, the first page is Heru out of ancient Kemet. Okay, that's on the first page, Heru out of ancient Kemet. And then we look at on the front, we see different symbols from the metal netter. Okay, uh, we see the eye of Heru, uh, we see a pyramid. And then on the back, we see some of those same symbols. Then we see the Ankh, the African key. Or African symbol of eternal life, the Ankh. And we know that plays a part in the story of Asar, Aset, and Heru, and um, Aset being impregnated um, with the uh, virgin, uh, the, the virgin Aset being impregnated with the baby Heru, who's going to be born on December 25th. All this is connected. This comes out of ancient African mythology, spiritual systems. This is all connected. All right. Now. So uh, this article here from Amazon uh, from uh, dealing with Amazon dot com. This is from face to face Africa dot com. Africa's oldest ethnic group fights to keep ancestral land away from Amazon reach. Amazon dot com reaches from June 4th, 2021. This is a Khoisan, uh, Khoisan man. Uh, Amazon is looking to build its new uh, African headquarters in Cape Town, South Africa, in a project that will take between three and five years. However, the land on which the multi-billion dollar um, corporation seeks to put its edifice belongs to the local Khoisan people, belongs to the local Khoisan people, reputed to be the oldest existing people in the world. Read the rest of this article here, dealing with the Khoisan, okay? These, these are the short statured Africans. They're the ancestors that I knew in the Twa to go all around the world and they were here in this land as well. All right, how y'all like this type of information? We're gonna post the link again here so you can register for the online course. This starts up um, Sunday, uh, July 4th, the 4th of July, as uh, Dr. Shaka Musa Baron Shango called it, the 4th of July. He wrote the books uh, African People and Euro European Holidays and Mental Genocide, book one and book two. Uh, so when you go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, 
uh, scroll down the home page and you'll see the information for our radio show scroll down you see the information for the online course okay and we got a flyer here click right here for register here it takes you to the next page click on enroll as soon as you uh, enroll you can start watching uh, course content and like I said we have a class uh, on Saturday that's wrapping up we have like three more sessions of the Saturday class so we're going to do two things for you you're going to enroll you in the Saturday class, so you can watch the last uh, three sessions or so that meets on Saturdays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we'll enroll you in the new course that starts with class number one on Sunday, July 1st. OK, Sunday, July 1st, um, 2021. And it's going to be 2 p.m. Uh, class is going to be 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. And we do the class live. All the all the classes are live. But we record all of them as well. All the sessions are recorded. So if you miss anything, you can go back and watch it um, archived on demand. And you can watch from around the world as well. All right. So let me post the link here. You can register for the online course. You can start watching content right away. And um, you also in the uh, Saturday class that you also get the archives of you can watch the class that where um archaeologist uh, uh nubia wartford spoke to our class she's an african-american female archaeologist we talked about the origins of ancient kush and the african queens of antiquity and then um also you can see the class where dr david m hotep spoke to our class as well uh the author of the first americans where africans documented evidence all right, so we just posted the link here. Let's go back to the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, so we do a when did Africans first come to the U.S. as slaves? Did Africans sell themselves under slavery? We did with that complicated history. Were African people in America before the uh, transatlantic slave trade? Absolutely. We're, we were here before Native Americans came into existence. When we deal with Columbus, Columbus is crucial to understanding the uh exploitation of indigenous people and the spread of capitalism, racism, slavery, etc. Columbus and his four voyages. Um, so he set sail August 3rd, 1492 on the Nina Depenta and the Santa Maria. And he ends up in um, the Bahamas or what he calls San Salvador, October 12th, 1492. This is why Columbus Day is celebrated on October 12th. Uh, he goes into Cuba and Hispaniola, which is Haiti. His um, second voyage, September 1493, he goes into the West Indies and Boriquin, which is Puerto Rico and Jamaica in 1494. His third voyage, May 1498, he goes into Trinidad and the Venezuelan mainland in South America. And fourth voyage, May 1504, he goes into Panama and Honduras in Central America. He never comes to the land that we call the United States of America. OK, he never comes to the land that we call the United States of America. So all those uh, statues of Christopher Columbus, you know, they should come down in the U.S. I'm against tearing statues. I'm, I'm against that because I don't want people to do that to uh, statues of our heroes. But they, the, the, the authorities, city council, governors, they should take all those statues down, put them in museums. OK, all those statues of uh, the master genocide, uh, Columbus. Uh, should should uh, come down. He was a fraud also. Uh, read uh, one of the books we use is Christopher Columbus and the African Holocaust, Slavery and the Rise of European Capitalism by uh, Dr. John Henrik Clark. There's another book we use in the class. Christopher Columbus and the African Holocaust, Slavery and the Rise of European Capitalism by one of our Grandmaster Scholar Warriors, Dr. John Henrik Clark. All right, let's continue here quickly. So uh, some other things we deal with in the online course, the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. This is critical, crucial to understanding the transatlantic slave trade, understanding this history. OK, uh, we can't just go from ancient Kemet and ta and Nubia and things like this, Abyssinia, Ethiopia to the slave trade. 
you got to deal with that 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, who had taken the teachings from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt into Europe, is bringing Europe out of the Dark Ages and is going to save Europe from the Black Death, the bubonic plague, which hits and spurts from 1347 AD to 1400. And um, Europe lost between one quarter to one third of the population because of the Black Death. And they're coming out of the Dark Ages and they're going in and conquering people's land, extracting the mineral wealth out, setting up sugarcane plantations. And Europe is, is rebuilding itself as well. OK, so they, they go from the Dark Ages into the Renaissance age, which is an age of enlightenment, allegedly. Uh, we do a shocking archaeological discoveries that are causing exper experts to rethink everything. Insurance companies that took out insurance policies on slave ships and enslaved Africans on plantations, Freemasonry, America and the founding fathers, um, the origins of the term America, Africa and more. So there's a lot we deal with. This is a 10 week online course here. Uh, the problem with slave movies, why, why are we being bombarded with slave movies and slave themed TV shows? And this is something I talked about even when the movie, the TV show Underground was on. You know, we're the TV shows about Africans in antiquity and ancient Kemet and Tana Hesse when we ruled nations. OK, well, where where are um, um, where are TV shows like that? If you're going to have TV shows like Underground, you're going to have TV shows during slavery. OK, where, where are TV shows um, of Africans in antiquity when we were ruling empires in Ghana, Shanghai and Mali, different things like that. Uh, we do what I saw. I said in Heru and the origins of the Immaculate Conception story. And what you're what you're going to see is a lot of these. Um, you're going to see that. A lot of these stories that we see now, this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness, but a lot of the stories that we see in Christianity. Or in other religions are going to be adaptations of much older stories coming out of ancient Africa. And they're going to be adapted to various people's cultures and the names are changed and things like this. OK, but we see this even with the Helios Biblos or the Sun Book or what we call the Holy Bible. When we look at the word Christ, the word Christ comes from the Greek word Christos. And we know Christ meaning anointed one or anointed. But this goes back to Karest. K-A-R-S-T, Karest, which means the rising of the spirit, which is uh out of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. So, you know, it's one of my teachers, Professor Kabahaya Watha Kamane says, to understand the existence of something, you must first understand the pre-existence of existence. To understand the existence of something, you must first understand the pre-existence of existence. So we deal with um, all that in the, the uh, Asar, Aset, and Heru, and the origins of the Immaculate Conception story links to ancient Kemet, Egypt, and early Christianity, Freemasonry in America. And we know Freemasonry is based upon the teachings coming out of ancient Kemet in the mystery systems, the, the Grand Lodges out of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. The fake Willie Lynch letter, 1712, the African influence in the film Black Panther, because the film Black Panther is deep on multiple levels. I did like three months of research on the film Black Panther and the comic book to be able to do my lectures on it. And, um, you know, it, it the, the language spoken in the film Black Panther is Isi Kosa, which is a Bantu language, is a real African language. W uh, Wakanda is a um, is a key Congo word, but Wakanda is also a Native American uh, word. We see it in Omaha Ponca and Sioux Indian languages. Um, it means possesses secret powers, Wakanda. Now, what was the transatlantic slave trade? Um, the transatlantic slave trade was the forced journey of African people from Europe to Africa to the Americas. Trinkets from Europe exchanged for Africans or used uh, or, 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 uh, or they used money to purchase them. It lasts from basically the 1440s to 1865, right about 1441 with the Portuguese going into in the Mauritania. What was the Middle Passage? The Middle Passage was the leg of the triangular trade from Africa to America or the New World. Manufactured uh, products such as rum. Textiles, weapons, gunpowder, etc., were taken from Europe to Africa in exchange for uh, Africans who would become slaves, uh, or for exchange for gold and silver. The, uh, the 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 African slaves were then sold in the Americas. 
Caribbean, etc., for raw materials such as uh, sugar, molasses, um, which was turned into rum, uh, tobacco, later on cotton, and also for fish, flour, and foodstuffs. Okay, this deals with the Middle Passage. So we go through and break down all this, show you step by step. We have maps, etc., to get a better understanding of all this. And, and this brings you right up to today. We can go through a chronology of history. Uh, the attacks on the the voting rights of African Americans. We we can go back to eighteen nine. We'll go back to eighteen seventy. Actually, we'll go back to eighteen seventy with the Fifteenth um, Amendment being ratified February third, eighteen seventy, and adopted. Fifteenth Amendment guaranteed the right to vote for African American men. And this is during Reconstruction. Reconstruction is uh, basically eighteen sixty five to eighteen seventy seven. After the Civil War ends, and um, we're going to see as soon as the uh, 15, 15th Amendment is adopted, we're going to see efforts to start putting obstacles in the way of African Americans voting. We're going to see these written into state constitutions, like the Mississippi State Constitution of 1890, which uh, made poll taxes and literacy tests legal. OK, and we're going to see other uh, southern states start adopting state constitutions with these obstacles in the way of African Americans voting in them, because during Reconstruction, we had about 2000 African American elected officials that we voted in the office. OK. And uh, many of them were former slaves. And uh, you have uh, white men who are who are focusing on shutting this down. So they start putting these obstacles in the way of us voting. And the lawsuit of Williams versus uh, Mississippi of 1898, the U.S. Supreme Court rules that it is uh, it does not violate the Constitution to have poll taxes and literacy tests. OK. So and then they're going to have the grandfather clause of 1898, which states that if your grandfather could not vote because he was a slave, then you can't vote. So they're putting all these obstacles in the way of us of us voting. This is why you needed this, uh, a voting rights act of 1965. Going back to uh, things in the late 1800s and, and these state constitutions and the Texas state constitution, of 1876, Louisiana state constitution, of 1898. All this history is connected. It brings you right up to today. All right, let's continue. Okay, so this is Renoka Rashidi. Uh, Renoka's a friend of mine, and we use uh, uh, two of his books for reference in the uh, online course also, uh, Golden Age of the Moor and the African Presence, uh, the uh, Black Star, the African Presence in Early Europe. This is Dr. David M. Hotel, who wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. I've interviewed him, I think, 14 times, something like that. Um, his, his book, has 713 footnotes and deals with the uh, African presence in the uh, Americas dating back at least 56,000 years ago and 51,700 years ago in the land we call the United States of America. If you, uh, page 14 of his book deals with a discovery in Allendale County, South Carolina from um, uh, 2004 that Dr. Albert Goodyear made. OK, the Dr. Albert Goodyear made and Dr. Albert Goodyear is an archaeologist at the University of South Carolina. They found 13 different types of evidence fairly documenting an African presence in South Carolina dating back at least 51,700 years ago. 13 different types of evidence. They found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints in lava, genetic M174 D haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics. Uh, linguistics, skulls, skeleton structures and tools. OK. And paintings, uh, linguistics, paintings, skulls, skeleton structures and tools. They found 13 different types of evidence. fairly fairly documenting an African presence in the Americas dating back at least uh, 51,700 years ago. This is before Native Americans came into existence. And, this, and these were the Khoisan. Who I just showed you a picture of also. Now, this is Dr. Albert Goodyear, OK? And Dr. Albert Goodyear is a white um, archaeologist uh, at the University of South Carolina. This is an article from ScienceDaily.com from November 18, 2004. All right. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in as well. Uh, we're going to post a link again. You can register for the online course. It starts up Sunday, uh, July 4th. 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is a 10-week online course. 
ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. Okay. And um, you can uh, you re you register for it uh, now, and we do the classes live. All the sessions are also recorded, so you can go back and watch it over and over again. And we'll also enroll you in the Saturday class that we have that's wrapping up now. It has about three more classes, and you'll be able to join us live in the Saturday class, which is uh, meets 12 noon to 2 p.m. on Saturday, Eastern Standard Time. But also we have the previous classes of the Saturday class archives. So you'll be able to watch those as well. This article here from ScienceDaily.com, which is a scientific website. And it has um, archaeological discoveries, different things like that. Uh, there's an article entitled New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. November 18, 2004, ScienceDaily.com. Here's a summary of what the article says. Uh, radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains where artifacts were unearthed last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County by University of South Carolina archeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age. Okay, these were the Khoisan. This is before Native Americans come into existence. This is a summary. This is not my summary. This is the summary from ScienceDaily.com about the discovery in 2004 that Dr. Albert Goodyear made. And we go through and we look at numerous recent archaeological discoveries that, that are just mind blowing. And, and when these new discoveries come out, the scientists, the paleontologists are saying we have to rethink everything. There was one, um, the lost city of Egypt, uh, the Golden City, dates back uh, 3000 years ago. Um, but they're saying that we have to rethink everything. We have to push the timelines back. Okay. You know, juvenile had the song back that thing up like 1998, 1999. When these new discoveries come out, they keep having to back the timelines up. They keep having to back these things up. So the deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. And these archeological discoveries are coming out, um, you know, every other week, something like that. Uh, this is Dr. David M. Hotep. He was interviewed on uh, WKRP in Cincinnati, Channel 5. Let me uh, play an excerpt of this interview. Just one second. This gives you some more uh, background information because a lot of people don't know this information. I was just saying, that we have a picture of the book, too. It's the first Americans were Africans. And we were talking about Dr. Ivan Van Sertima, because I remember um, back in the 1980s, my dad took me to hear him. He came here to Cincinnati, and his book was They Came Before Columbus, and he talked about you know, how Africans were here. He had a lot of, I mean, great research information. And so it was just kind of eye-opening. But we, don't, we haven't heard a lot about that recently. So tell us how... You, you got involved here. Well, I'm showing that uh, they, Africans not only came from Plymouth, they came from the Indians. You're going even farther back. I'm going farther back, at least 56,000 years old. Okay, now we've got a graphic up here about 130,000 years ago. Yeah, well, they sailed over here. And uh, when I lecture, people say, well, wait a minute, uh, humans weren't, weren't sailing with them. They were not boating uh, 130,000 years ago. And I beg to differ. Uh, last year, the New York Times uh, quoted the BBC, and uh, they wrote an article on how in Crete they have found a, a stone industry of stone tools going back to at least 130,000 years. And Crete wow. has been an island for in the middle of the, the Mediterranean for five million years. So they had to sail, and it was a continuous civilization, which means they were going back and forth. They knew how to navigate. So if they got to Crete 130,000 years ago, it's easy 70,000 years later that they could make it to the Americans. Right. That's really, now how did you, how did you even get back to this research? I mean, this is just, you know, did you start by, by reading they came before Columbus and then you just, you expanded on that research? Yes. Yeah. You see, there, 36 years ago, uh, Dr. Van Sermon's book came out and this information is piled on for 36 years. So many different things, so many cutting edge articles and, and things have been found since then. Well, and tell us a little bit about these Africans who, who came before the Indians, before Columbus. Okay, uh, they came here, and uh, they were first, uh, they came to uh, Tierra, uh, excuse, excuse me, uh, uh, Pedro Ferreira, which is north, 
southeastern Brazil. You'll uh -huh. see that that's the closest point uh, from Africa to South America. And by canoe, a, uh, a fellow, uh, a navigator uh, who was a doctor, wanted to prove that it could be done just in a canoe. And he set out in a canoe uh, with a supply ship, but it did not touch him. He had a canoe with no oars, no, um, um, no paddle, no sail, nothing. He just sat there, and the currents took him straight from Africa to here. You've heard about people if you throw a, a bottle in, in the uh, water yeah. with a note, it'll come over. Yes, right. there are rivers in the ocean, currents, and it took him 52 days only. So you put a large sail on that vessel, wow. and you get here in less than a month. So it's definitely possible. We know that. It's physically possible. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so what part of, of Africa were the Africans from who, who, who came to Brazil? Well, the DNA, uh, the genome the um, genome project uh, found that the earliest ones, uh, the, the ones that they found in Tierra del Fuego, in the very tip of, of South America in uh, 1874, 1876, uh, were the short Africans, the Khoisan, who spoke the clicks like, like that. The gods must be crazy did us up. A movie on yeah, it. I remember that. Yeah. Yes. So they have about the, the Coca Cola bottle yes. that fell in. Yeah. Yes. They have the oldest DNA and the oldest language on the planet, and they were all over. Oh, wow. All over all three Americas, as now, well as now, Asia. As well, have they done any DNA tests in Brazil to see that? Yes, they have. The Genome Project went all around the world. There were 100,000 people participated. Wow. Taking DNA swabs. And so, so first we know that it's possible to get over here by, by canoe, and second of all, the DNA from that group of Africans is yes. in Brazil. The most important thing, not, not to forget, to, to ask me, well, I, I will tell you that, where do the Native Americans come from? Well, we've always been taught that they came across the Bering Straits from Asia. This is true, but they did not come until 3000 BC. There is no evidence of them coming before 3000 BC. So for 53,000 years, there were nothing but Africans in North, Central, and South America. Wow. When they come over 3000 BC, those two groups, the Africans and the Mongolians, get together, Asians, get together, and their children are the Native Americans. Wow. This that's... is why the Native Americans do not look Chinese. They are a little different than Chinese. Right. Okay. So that was an excerpt from uh, 2011. Uh, Dr. David M. Hotep was interviewed on uh, WKRP in Cincinnati, Channel 5 um, in Cincinnati. If you're old enough to remember the 1970s, 1980s TV show about the radio station, uh, WKRP in Cincinnati. There really is a WKRP in Cincinnati, Channel 5. I don't know if it's a radio station, but there is a TV station. And that's on YouTube. You can check out that video. Uh, this is a archaeological, archaeological discovery that we deal with here. Uh, this is from the New York Times. It deals with on Crete, very ancient mariners, and it talks about stone tools found on the Greek island of Crete that date back 130,000 years ago. Uh, this is from February 15, 2010. These stone tools date back 100 and, 130,000 years ago, but Crete has been an island for more than 5 million years, which means that uh, the people had to have sailed there. And this, push backs, this pushes back uh, sailing in the Mediterranean uh, 130,000 years ago. Uh, originally, the archaeological archaeologists uh, archaeologists thought that uh, sailing in the Mediterranean dated back no earlier than 10,000, 12,000 years ago. So they had to push that timeline back to about 130,000 years ago. Okay. So they keep having to back that thing up. Uh, so we do with the Druids who are dealing with a watered down version of teachings coming out of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. Uh, we do with the discovery of Tanis Heraklion, the lost city of Egypt uh, that was built around eighth, 8th century BC, okay, and it's swallowed up into, uh, this is about a 1,200-year-old uh, city that's swallowed up into the sea, and uh, the, the, this article here is from news.yahoo.com from April 30th, 2013, Sunken Egyptian City Reveals 1,200-Year-Old Secrets, and they found 16-foot-tall uh, statues uh, at the bottom of the sea, 700 anchors, uh, 64 ships they found Egypt's Bay of Abu Kir. They found 64 ships, and these are some of the statues they found statues of Osset. Uh, so I mean, this is these archaeological discoveries that they're finding are mind blowing. This deals with the uh, the 3,000 year old lost golden city of Egypt. That this discovery just came out April of 2021. So these discoveries are you know are, are endless. 
All right, now, uh, so these are just a few of the things that we deal with in the online course, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. This is a 10-week uh, online course that I teach. We deal with thousands of years of history and what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. And then when we look at, lastly, we look at something like this here, Egypt of the West. And uh, Browder talks a lot about this in Egypt on the Potomac. But we look at the symbolism and uh, we look at the Washington Monument. The Washington Monument is a Tekken, it's an ancient African symbol of resurrection coming from the story of Asar, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. And there are about 1,200 Tekkenu all throughout uh, ancient Kemet. Today, there are only about 12 or so uh, left. And so the Washington Monument is a is a Tekken. The Greeks call it an obelisk. But we see this symbol also in Freemasonry. And we know Freemasonry is based upon uh, teachings coming out of ancient Africa, especially the Nile Valley region of Africa. So if we look at the word Freemasonry, and this comes from Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder, uh, the word Mason is derived from the Latin words mass and sun. Mason means child of light and expresses uh, the desire to pursue light, which is a metaphor for the sun, which symbolizes knowledge. The term child of light or sons and daughters of light was first used to identify students who had completed 42 years of study in the temples of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. Many Masonic temples were modeled after the temples of, of ancient Kemet, places where light or knowledge was imparted in a series of steps or degrees, in a series of steps or degrees. So when we look at the origins of liberal arts colleges, we see this is coming from the uh, the, 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 the uh, temples and the uh, mystery systems in ancient Kemet. And if you read uh, Go, uh, Stolen Legacy by Jewish G.M. James, uh, Stolen Legacy, uh, he deals with the seven liberal arts. Stolen Legacy by Jewish G.M. James, and he deals with the seven liberal arts and the trivium and the quadrivium and the, uh, the rhetoric and the logic and the arithmetic, things like this. Uh, so the concept of going to college, getting your uh, credentials in a series of steps or degrees is an African concept. This is where this comes from. And this is where the liberal arts come from also. But we don't understand this history. OK, this is coming from us. Um, and historically, the concept of light was associated with knowledge. OK, uh, in school, if you have a child that's smart, you may say that's a bright child, B-R-I-G-H-T, associated with light. If it's a child that's not bright, you may say that's a dim child or dim witted child. Uh, if you see a cartoon in the cartoon character, Doc McStuffins or Tom and Jerry or Mickey Mouse, whatever it is, uh, Paw Patrol. My daughter likes Paw Patrol. Uh, if they have an idea, a light bulb may go off over their head. OK, to signify that they have an idea or a good idea, a bright idea. Right. And so when we look at Europe in the Dark Ages and Europe gets cast into the Dark Ages with the fall of the Western portion of the Roman Empire in 476 A.D., when the Vandals and the Visigoths come down and crush the Western portion of the Roman Empire, it casts Europe into a period of darkness. This is ignorance. This is a period of ignorance. OK, hundreds of years of ignorance. The Dark Ages. So uh, all this deals with history and ties into ancient Africa. Uh, look at pages 18 and 32 of Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. Now, 50 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons and 13 of the 39 signers of the U.S. Constitution were Freemasons. Four of the first five U.S. presidents were Freemasons, and there have been 14 Freemasons who have been U.S. presidents also. Uh, here's a famous uh, statue of Asar, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus, and Aset was the virgin. OK, who in uh, this and you're going to find out that the Mac of the Conception story is thousands of years older than we thought thousands of years before it resurfaced in the Helios Biblos, the sun book with uh, the Virgin Mary and the baby Jesus. This may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness, but the letter J uh, did not exist until 1630 A.D. The letter J is derived from the letter I. The letter J is derived from the letter I. Uh, and when you look at the word Jesus in the dictionary and look at the etymology of the word Jesus, it takes you back to uh, Yeshua. 
which is Hebrew, it takes you back to the Yeshua with the Y, because the letter J did not exist until 1630 AD. You can go to maybe like Britannica.com and look up the letter J, and it tells you the origins of the letter J. The letter J comes to, comes from the uh, is derived from the letter I, and in the historical origin of Christianity by Dr. Walter Williams in chapter nine. Chapter nine deals with the whole history of the letter J. Okay, and I know Dr. Walter Williams have interviewed him a number of times also. Uh, this is from The Secrets of Isis, the TV show that came on Saturday mornings on uh, CBS. They had a Shazam and Isis hour. And we didn't know that Isis was a copy. This white woman, Isis, was a copy of an African woman named Osset, who the Greeks called Isis. OK, this is where this comes from. When you watch this show and on Hulu, I think they still may have episodes of, of it. Um, at the beginning of the, of the show, they talk about how she gets her powers from ancient Egypt. And they start talking about the names of Netru, Hathor, uh, Hit, Hit, Heru, all th different types of things like this. But they're showing us ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet. But we don't know that they are co-opting it. OK, and we don't know it was an African woman, Isis, all set. Uh, and so then from all set with the baby Heru, born on December 25th of a virgin birth, you get the Black Madonna child that was worshipped all throughout Europe by Europeans. They still have statues of the Black Madonna child in Europe today, in uh, uh, Spain and Portugal and France and Russia, Czechoslovakia. They still have statues of the Black Madonna child. And then we get the uh, white baby in Jesus from this also. OK. All right. So these are just a few of the things that we deal with uh, in the online course. Uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. It's a 10-week online course that I teach. We did with thousands of years of history and what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Lastly, um, I talked about Black Panther. The language spoken in the film Black Panther is Isikosa. Um, and Isikosa is the Bantu language. Bantu languages are a group of... Uh, 500 African languages, uh, 500 African languages uh, belonging to the Bantoid uh, subgroup of the Banu uh, Congo branch of the Niger Congo language family. The Bantu languages are spoken in a huge, large area, including most of Africa, from southern Cameroon eastward to Kenya and southward to the southernmost tip of the continent of Africa. 12 Bantu languages are spoken by more than 5 million people, including Rundi, Rwanda, Shona, Isikosa. Isikosa is the language spoken in the film Black Panther, also called Kosa, and Zulu or Amazulu. Now, Swahili or Kiswahili, K-I, Kiswahili, which is spoken by 5 million people as a mother tongue and some 30 million as a second language, is a Bantu lingua franca important in both commerce and uh, literature. OK, uh, this information came from Britannica.com, Encyclopedia Britannica. But there are other sources dealing with Bantu languages that you can look at as well. And as I said, the word Wakanda is a very ancient word, even though Wakanda is a fictitious place. Wakanda is a world word. We see it in Sioux Indian and, and Omaha Ponca languages, and it means uh, possess secret powers. It's also a Bantu word as well. Now, I know um, Kanda is key Congo. And the word Kanda, K-A-N-D-A, means uh, family in um, Key Congo. I'm trying to find the exact language, the exact Bantu language that Wakanda is from. Maybe Key Congo, I'm not sure. But I know Kanda is Key Congo as well. But I know it's a Bantu uh, word. I'm just trying to find ex exactly which Bantu language. All right. So uh, we deal with the film Black Panther in the uh, in the online course as well, because Black Panther incorporates 11 different African cultures. It deals with African history, African spiritual systems is a deep movie. And the Wakanda salute comes straight out of ancient Kemet. It's the position of the Nisubitis or the pharaohs. Uh, it's always right over left. It's the position of power uh, of the, the pharaohs when they when they're deceased, when they when you have the uh, 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 the Nisubitis, the uh, when, when you have the uh, mummies, the the, the, the uh, tombs. So and we see this go all around the world as well. OK, you see this right over left go all around the world. All right. So uh, we'll post a link here for the online course uh, as well. And it's at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. 
and we do the classes live. Uh, it starts, uh, the class starts Sunday, July 4th, uh, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're going to also enroll you in the Saturday class that's wrapping up. That meets on Saturdays, 12 noon. As soon as you register, you can start watching uh, archive content that we have right now. Uh, classes one through seven of the Saturday class. You can start watching that. And uh, you'll be ready for a Sunday class that starts up Sunday, July 4th, the 4th of July. Because they lied and said that uh, it was Independence Day. Well, maybe their Independence Day, but they were still dependent upon slaves also. Uh, so <laughs> um, we have this information at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com as well. Let's see. If we go to when you go to our website. Uh, scroll down and you'll see uh, information for the radio show and information for the online course. Click register here. It takes you to the next page. Click on enroll. As soon as you enroll, you can start uh, watching the content. OK. And the class is regularly one hundred thirty dollars. So it's also eighty dollars. And you still have access to the course even after the 10 week course is over with. OK, because remember all the we do the classes live, but they're all archived. You can watch from around the world. You can use this with your children. I would say it's PG-13. Um, it, so it's not overly vulgar and we don't do a lot of cursing, things like that. But, you know, we have to deal with uh, some violence and unpleasant topics as well, dealing with slavery. OK. And if you want to support the African History Network, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. That helps us keep doing the research, uh, stay on the air, keep broadcasting. I show six days a week, pay some of the bills as well. Dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Uh, when it processes you know, at our website or when you click on the link, when it processes the um, uh, payment for the course, it, uh, you can do debit card or credit card. It processes it through PayPal. If you want to do it through Cash App, um, you can um, email me, um, AHN show at African History Network dot com, AHN show at at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And you can send it through Cash App if you like. Uh, let me know it's for the course, so I know what it's for. And be sure to do dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Um, and it says, it, it'll say Michael, and it'll show my picture there. Because uh, and we I created this chart here because somebody set up some fake cash app accounts, uh, some fake African History Network cash app accounts, and they've been stealing money from us. So I already reported them to um, cash app. So. You see the real one here is our, our tag is dollar sign the AHN show SHOW and it says Michael shows my picture. These other ones are fake ones. OK, and they were all set up after um, uh, I set up mine as well. OK. All right. Look, we had to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering and uh, inspiring African people throughout the diaspora and around the world. Uh, because right now it's correct wrong behavior. Be sure to listen to the African History Network show Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we broadcast here on. Uh, our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I M H O T E P, and we're on 9 10 a.m. the Superstation WFDF in Detroit. You can download the iHeartRadio app and listen to the show live. And then also, uh, that's at 9 10 a.m. WFDF, uh, listen on iHeartRadio. And you can search for The African History Network show on iHeartRadio. iHeartRadio, they have about 3.5. 